Chapter thirty six of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. Fanatics of Islam. From what has been published about the changes wrought by the Turkish Republic, one might think that the old Mohammedanism had passed away, and that from now on the lions of the Prophet and the lambs of the Christians would lie down together. The truth is that the democratic and progressive spirit is confined largely to the educated Turks, to the officials, and to the army controlled by them. Though there has been an apparent separation of church and state, under the surface Islam will probably continue to rule, for the earnest follower of the Prophet is as fanatical today as he was when Mohammed II conquered Constantinople in 1453 and made it the capital of the Ottoman Empire instances of such fanaticism are to be seen everywhere throughout the interior of turkey and the fervor of the believers is evident in their religious celebrations here in constantinople the mohammedans are divided into almost as many different sects as the christians among these are the dervishes of whom a recent survey of constantinople under american auspices reports that there are one hundred and seventy seven different orders and suborders. The dervishes are to be found everywhere in Turkey, and their religion is said to be their whole life. They have some 250 public meeting places in Constantinople, and each order has its peculiar ceremonies and customs. All claim to represent the mystic side of Mohammedanism, and through denial of the earthly claims of the body, seek to bring the soul closer to God. The whirling dervishes have a mosque in the European section of Constantinople, near the Grand Rue de Pera, where you may see the devotees go through their gyrations once a week the year round. In another quarter is a house devoted to the howling dervishes, where the believers are even more fanatical. This is on the side of a hill just below the YMCA and not far from the Pera Palace Hotel. The whirling dervishes wear mantles like that of Mohammed and high gray sugar loaf caps, which they say resemble the form of the vase in which Mohammed's soul was kept before the present world was created. They claim that their order originated with a sultan who lived more than 200 years before the day of Columbus. This man was like Buddha in that he left the throne and renounced the world. He was a writer and many of his verses have become proverbs. The sect is now governed by his lineal descendants, and every member has to serve for 1,001 days as a subordinate before he can be admitted to full privileges. The Mevlevi, as these dervishes are called, have exercises every Tuesday and Friday, when they whirl wildly around on their toes and dance around to the sound of a tambourine, chanting of the goodness of the one God and the vanity of earthly existence. As they spin around, they hold out their arms, the right above the head and the left below, and keep both hands open. Their eyes are closed and their heads are bent sideways on the shoulders. By doing this, they claim they are able to send their souls into the world of dreams, so that for the time, their spirits leave their bodies and become one with the Creator. The particular phrases for the invocation of God, which are supposed to prepare them for the separation of soul and body must be repeated hundreds of times a day i have just spent two hours with the howling dervishes this order has its meetings every thursday afternoon and visitors are admitted the ceremonies are wildly fanatical the men work themselves into an ecstasy during which they eat fire run knives through their flesh batter their heads against the wall and fall down on the floor foaming at the mouth in their religious frenzy. One can scarcely believe that such horrible observances could survive in this modern age, but their existence was proved to me this afternoon in the scenes I shall describe. The mosque where the howlers assembled was not large, and the room where the services took place was only about 30 feet square. The floor was covered with sheepskins with the wool on, and at the back, in a little alcove, not bigger around than a wagon wheel was a turkish rug upon which sat the sheik or high priest wearing turban and gown sitting on their heels upon the sheepskins were a motley group 
one man was dressed in shirt vest and trousers but the green turban of the pilgrim to mecca covered his head when in the height of his ecstasy he took off his turban his long black hair hung from his semi-bald head down to the buckle on the back of his vest i noticed some boys of ten or twelve in the crowd little fellows dressed in black and wearing fezes and also a frail-looking girl of six who was to have a place in the exercises near the close of the ceremony before the service began a man brought in an iron bowl as big as a wash basin filled with live charcoal in which were heating two iron spoons with flat bowls and handles almost a foot long behind the sheik in the alcove were knives of various kinds swords and long sharp steel skewers with wooden knobs on one end i saw the reason for these later on the first business was to excite the worshippers the old sheik began making little sermons after each of which the believers threw themselves back and forth whirling their heads around as though on pivots and shouting in unison verses that i suppose came from the koran one of these sounded like la illa 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 divided into six syllables as they uttered the first the dervishes bent forward at the second they raised themselves and at the third they bent backwards then swayed back and forth crying and howling they sang together chanting faster and faster to keep time with the music after a while the syllables got jumbled together until one heard nothing but wild cries of ill and la as they went on their faces grew red some of them foamed at the mouth and some began to jerk spasmodically then they rose to their feet and whirled around jumping up and down and stamping like madmen meantime the coals in the brazier had died down but the old sheik fanned them into a glow and a little later took out the red-hot iron paddles these were grabbed by two of the worshippers who trotted around the room gingerly licking them while the rest shrieked in ecstasy as the irons cooled the fanatics kept them in their mouths longer and longer and finally handed them back to the sheik i could see no steam rising and did not hear the flesh sizzle yet their tongues must have been burned by the red-hot irons while this was going on other devotees took the steel skewers i have described and allowed the sheik to run them through their cheeks how this was done without causing the blood to flow i do not know but i am sure the skewers went through the flesh for i could see the wooden knob on one side of a man's jaw and the steel point on the other one man took a stone and pressing the point of the skewer that had passed through his cheek against a wooden post of the building pounded on the knob kneeling himself as it were to the post after a while the sheik came and pulled out the skewer he put some of his spittle on the wound and that i suppose made it well half a dozen different dervishes performed this operation of nailing themselves to the post three of them were within ten feet of me and i do not see how there could have been any deceit in the business by this time the howling had risen to a pandemonium and bedlam seemed to have broken loose the green turbaned mecca pilgrim was one of the most violent he rolled his head around as if it were on ball bearings making something like one hundred revolutions per minute then all at once he made a dive for a wooden pillar on the opposite side of the hall butting it with his head the noise of the impact was like the crack of a pistol he did this three times before he sank exhausted to the floor a little later the sheik began to cure the sick the little girl i have described was laid face down on the floor the old man stood on her back and placing his hands on the shoulders of two men on each side jumped up and down the little girl did not cry out he next trod on a sick boy in the same way and then it seemed to me took special delight in performing a dance on the body of a sick man the whole affair was horrible in the extreme the crying and foaming of these howlers will recur to my mind whenever i think of the depths of religious emotionalism and how the world over it can rob man of his reason so much for the darker side of mohammedanism now let me show you some of its brighter aspects as i have seen them in this stronghold of the moslem world you all know how centuries ago the mohammedans were among the most famous scholars of mankind they were skilled in the sciences 
especially in mathematics and astronomy and the universities of baghdad cairo and fez were noted all over europe today constantinople is full of books written in languages now largely forgotten the mosque of santa sophia has a big collection of more than five thousand manuscripts which are being catalogued and repaired among them i saw an illuminated koran the size of a sheet of note paper and about as thick as my finger every page was a picture in itself and it must have taken a lifetime to make all those sheets of hand-drawn and colored characters the sheik in charge told me that the book was more than a thousand years old and that it was worth fifteen thousand dollars another volume in ancient persian script much larger is said to be the third book ever written about the stars the author was an egyptian who lived three thousand years ago some of the books in the library have gold covers and some are so precious that they are kept under lock and key and are not shown to strangers many came from the loot of victorious moslem armies of the past and some have been sent here from the centers of mohammedanism in other parts of the world santa sophia has been for nearly five centuries in the hands of the moslems but it was built by christians on christmas eve in the year 537 the emperor justinian dedicated the great edifice to santa sophia which means in greek the wisdom or word of god and thus stands for christ himself standing beside a mosaic representing solomon looking around in wonder and admiration the emperor shouted aloud glory to god who has deemed me worthy to accomplish such an undertaking solomon i have surpassed thee this he had undoubtedly done for santa sophia is ten times the size of solomon's temple and far more splendid later it became known as next to st peter's the largest church in the world a terrestrial paradise the car of the cherubim the throne of the glory of god and the marvel of the earth it has been estimated by a noted greek scholar that the cost including expenditures for ground materials labor ornaments and church utensils was sixty four millions of dollars or more than has been spent for any other christian sanctuary ever erected to the glory of god the usual estimate of the cost of st peter's at rome is somewhat under forty eight million dollars no other christian church has approached santa sophia in the beauty and variety of its marbles or in the lavish use of silver gold and precious stones for decorations and for the sacred vessels the exterior has been changed for the worse since its erection the huge dome is now dwarfed by the buttresses built to stay it against earthquake shocks and the effects of time moreover the turks have daubed the building with a coating of plaster striped with broad bands of a deeper hue and heavy minarets have been added to the corners of the structure the first time i entered santa sophia was during an evening service in the month of ramadan imagine that immense room with its great dome supported on hundreds of marble columns its carved pulpit its thousands of lights its two great fountains and its gigantic turkish emblems and you will have some idea of my sensations as i entered great stars of flame seemed to me to be floating in the air between the lofty ceiling and the marble pavement every pillar and every alcove appeared to be ablaze the precious marbles of the walls and the gilded friezes of the arches and cornices threw back a thousand reflections the colors of the prayer rugs and the costumes of the worshippers added to the brilliant effect it was nine o'clock when through the liberal use of bakshish i slipped into the gallery and looked down on the devout moslems kneeling on the floor below me at least five thousand were bowed there with their faces toward mecca from the back of the mosque came the shrill voice of the imam leading the service his wonderful tenor penetrated the remotest part of the vast chamber and in response to its chanting the bodies of the five thousand turbaned and gowned men rose and fell as one when they sank down the striking of their ten thousand knees on the floor made a noise like the rumbling of a cannon in the distance and when they touched their foreheads on the floor there was the sound of the falling of some great weight at the end of the exercises each worshipper took up the shoes he had removed on entering the mosque 
and carrying them in his hand walked silently from the place in altering santa sophia to make it suit the requirements of a mohammedan mosque some of the priceless mosaics were covered over with plaster and whitewash and beautiful christian emblems were removed or defaced the innumerable gold and silver ornaments have disappeared the prayer rug scattered over the marble pavement and the pulpit from which a priest of islam reads the koran every friday do not belong here santa sophia still looks more like a christian church than a mohammedan mosque and as someone has said resembles a mighty captive ever mutely protesting against his chains the greek christians declare that some day the chains will be broken and that the church will fall once more into christian hands there is a tradition that on the day that the conqueror mohammed the second rode into the sanctuary to take it over in the name of the prophet a priest was saying mass at the altar the turkish soldiers drove him from his place and would have killed him but the wall opened and bearing the consecrated elements in his hands he disappeared the marble slabs closed behind him never to reopen until the cross replaces the crescent on the dome of santa sophia in answer to this legend the moslems point to a certain pillar in the mosque on which they say there is the print of the hand of mohammed the second when the turks entered the city twenty thousand christians crowded around and into the church of divine wisdom strong in their belief in an ancient prophecy that a miracle would deliver them from their enemies but the turkish soldiers burst in the doors threw down altars and tore down crucifixes gathered up all the treasures they could reach and such of the women as took their fancy and shackled the rest of the people together to be driven out and sold as slaves then entered mohammed the second on his great charger and rising in his stirrups he struck this pillar with his blood-stained hand and shouted there is no god but allah and mohammed is his prophet thus say the true believers he dedicated the christian temple to the faith of islam for all time end of chapter thirty six